Okay, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for so, being so patient as we move around uh, the various furniture to get us all uh, settled. My name is B. Banyu, and I just clicked to get rid of the slide. Click. Okay, there we go. Uh, um, and I'm chair of the food studies program here at the New School. So first is a little commercial about the food studies program before we have to uh, get started. Um, uh, the food studies program offers uh, an AAS, a two-year degree, and a four-year degree in food studies. We focus on a variety of different interdisciplinary topics, including culture, media, communication, health, environment, policy, and politics. We also offer uh, some classes in a new venue called Open Campus. So I suggest if anybody is interested in taking classes, uh, not for credit, just for fun, um, uh, that you check out our Open Campus. In fact, in the fall semester, we'll have two classes available through that um, particular portal uh, that you might find interesting. One of them is the language of food, um, and the other one is food and media. So. Uh, let me also explain some of the logistics that's going to happen tonight. We are being uh, videotaped, and at the end, we should have some Q&A, mm -hmm. right, time. Um, I'd ask you to please either come up for the uh, microphone or we'll try to get it to you so you can speak, because we want to make sure that we can uh, hear all the questions um, uh, that you have and uh, make sure that they're uh, legible on the video. All right, a couple of other things that you might be interested in. If, in fact, um, uh, you're interested in cookbooks, on March 28th, again at 6 p.m., we are having another event called The Culinary Legacy of the Joy of Cooking. This was purely accidental, as a matter of fact, but it works. The, the Joy of Cooking actually started um, being published um, right uh, after the Great Depression, and it was then published for 85 successive years. So quite an impact, right? Um, uh, I'm looking at the experts on this one. Um, and so it tells us a really interesting story of the various continuities and the changes in American kitchens, like who's doing the cooking, um, what's uh, going into the cooking, what's going out of fashion, and what's coming into fashion, a variety of different things that culinary, culinary historians and anthropologists alike uh, look at. Um, the people who will be um, on the panel are Amy Trubeck, anthropologist and chef from the University of Vermont, Ann Mendelson, food historian, yeah. Laura mm -hmm. Shapiro, uh, hist historian and journalist, Roseanne uh, Gold, chef, writer, uh, and one of us um, mm -hmm. at the New School. And it's moderated by um, Nack Waxman, who is the co founder of uh, Kitchen Arts and letters, so if you're interested, that's March 28th. It'll be on the university calendar. Um, and if you need to, you can sign up with uh, Marielle outside and we'll send you the information about um, our various events. There's another interesting thing that's happening in the fall, and that is we are um, going to be doing two massive open online courses. Based on our series, culinary luminaries. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, courses, they're both five weeks, uh, one of them is Innovators of American Cuisine, and the other one is Writing American Food. Mm. They're both through Canvas, so you would have to go into canvas.net and you would see uh, the course listings that are available through canvas.net. The listing for the first course, Innovators of American Cuisine, will open on April 23rd. The class itself starts on May 21st. Then the listing for writing American food starts right at the end of that class, which is May 21st. And the start date for that would be June 18th. So they'll run contiguously, but they're free. And so if you're interested at all, it'll be an opportunity to discuss um, with other people interested in food, um, uh, uh, all of these great luminaries, including people like Julia Child, of course, and Henri Soule, and Edna Lewis, and in the second class, MFK Fisher, Craig Claiborne, Clementine Paddleford. So a lot of interesting stuff going on there. So now we get into our program, Food on a Page. 
you should know that the books, food on the page, are actually available right back there for anybody to purchase. And the author, Megan Elias, is quite happy to um, uh, autograph them for you at the end of the program. So, but they're available at any time uh, that you need to go back. So <laughs> let me introduce um, our two protagonists here. <laughs> Megan Elias is the director of the gastronomy program up at Boston University. Very famous, um, very elegant program. <laughs> and she is the associate professor of practice at Boston University. She is the author of numerous books, including this one, and Stir It Up, Home Economics and American Culture, which is available uh, through the University of Pennsylvania Press. Then there's Kathy Kaufman, who is one of us. Mm -hmm. She is an adjunct professor of food studies in the New School and mm, at New York University, I have to say <laughs> that for completeness, where she received her master's degree in food studies. She has uh, she was the associate editor of Savoring Gotham, a food lover's companion to New York City, and a senior editor of the Oxford Enci Encyclopedia of Food and Drink in America. Her work has appeared in journals such as Performance, Gastronomica, and Vintage. So without further ado, Megan and Kathy. Thank you very much, Bea. Um, we have arranged this evening as a bit of a conversation, although poor Megan is going to have to do the lion's share of the work on this, because I'm going to be asking her a series of questions based on the book, which I have to say, it is a lovely, lovely book. It is a cultural history of America through the food uh, pages that we've seen. It, uh, while it is all about cookbooks, it tells you so much more about what's actually happening in America. So I highly, highly recommend it, even if you really don't care about food, which I can't imagine anyone sitting in here doesn't care about food. But even if you don't care about food, it will give you a way of looking at America and the way America has changed. So I'm going to ask her several questions, and then we're going to open it up to questions from the audience. And uh, I'm sure we'll have a lovely, lovely evening. Thank you. So uh, in your introduction, Megan, you state that every meal is at once a cultural statement and a performance of self. <laughs> I love that, but can you elaborate a bit on that? Oh, no, no. <laughs> Just one of those things you say, you know, when you're writing your introduction and you hope no one ever asks you about it later. Um, it's, I, I think what I meant is that you come to the table as yourself, but also as a creature of culture. So you've been made by your place, by the culture of the people around you, by your family, um, by the rules of your society, what is food, what is not food. Uh, by class expectations, and then it personally, you either adhere to these rules or, or challenge them yourself. Um, you have your own tastes, which help to shape that too. Um, but I also, I, I uh, subscribe to the belief that food is a voice, that what you choose as your food, and this is not my original idea, right? This is Annie Houck's idea. Um, what you choose as food is an expression of yourself. So as you eat, you present yourself to everyone around you as the person who ate the hamburger, right? Or the person who chose the, uh, the foshi, which was a, <laughs> a, a culinary creation of Kathy's. Um, and so I, I think I, I just meant that no, um, no act of eating is simply an act of eating. Even when people don't eat, they're also sort of presenting themselves as the person who didn't eat in that situation. Laura Shapiro's <laughs> most recent book, and Ava Brown, not really eating very right, much. Right. Yes, yes, what she ate. Another wonderful book uh, by Laura Shapiro. Um, food scholars often speak about the abilities of food, especially particular dishes, to communicate messions about class and changing mm -hmm. norms. And you've investigated community cookbooks. And these are you know, books that are generally produced by groups, usually women. Uh, associated with a particular locality, and they're for the purpose of fundraising. Apparently, as I think you've said, there's always a church steeple in dire shape <laughs> that needs to be uh, built up. So these community cookbooks are there uh, where these women contributors are amassing their prized favorite recipes. 
So you would think that these would be treasure troves of local cuisines, things that you could really identify as local. But your study showed that um, there's a remarkable consistency in the recipes, regardless of where the cookbooks are published. Uh, they tend to be relatively heavy on desserts because every woman was proud of her pastry, of course. Um, and the most common recipes you said during the late 19th or early 20th centuries uh, was for lemon pie. Yes, yeah, so, sorry, you wanted to ask a question. Well, just, what <laughs> why? Did, why lemon pie? What does it say about these women and about changing technologies and good? markets? <laughs> yeah, I mean, no, lemon meringue pie, that was one of the few things my mother made and it yeah. was good. Um, I think that may be part of it, that it, it, it is something that, that lots of people like the taste of and it's not that hard to make. Um, but what happened to me was that I was, I was reading through these books having no idea what I was going to find, not finding the thing I was hoping to find, which was a lot of regional specialties and regional identities. Um, and then realizing what I was finding was a kind of a portrait of the middle class through its food. So um, finding that, again, that food was a voice that a woman who contributes a recipe is speaking to her community, I am the woman who makes the lemon pie, or I am the woman who knows how to make lobster Newburgh, therefore I know something about you know, kind of cosmopolitan culture. Um, the woman who most intrigues me probably is the woman who contributed the recipe for, um, for poor, poor man's pudding. And what was she trying to say? It turns out it's the same recipe as the queen of puddings, which is also an interesting rabbit hole to go down. Um, is it rich? Is it poor? Who knows? So. I, as I was gathering these recipes, I thought, okay, well, if this is, if this is showing me a class, a kind of trans-regional class culture, what are the things that these people like? And so I started to create what I grandiosely called a database, which is actually just an Excel spreadsheet because I cannot handle more than that. And it was, I just noted every recipe in about 15 cookbooks um, and then ca sort of categorized them and then looked for patterns. And what I found was that the most common pie recipe was not for apple pie, which is what we've all been led to believe is our birthright as Americans, but for lemon pie. And that cookbooks would have up to five or six lemon pie recipes that varied not at all. They were exactly the same recipe, except they were contributed by different women. So one thing we know is there's not a lot of variety in lemon pie. Um, and I began to wonder, why was this the pie that so many people wanted to be known for? And I think it's a combination of, um, showing that you're, you're sort of a sensible person, right? You know how to make something that um, pleases people. But I realized that this is also, so this is the end of the 19th, beginning of the 20th century, that this is also the moment when lemons become available. And these objects that had been sort of rare and treasured uh, become, at least for the middle class, much more, more ordinary and available. Um, and if you think of, uh, does anyone know the recipe for shaker lemon pie? Yeah, so what goes in a shaker lemon pie? What makes it that? The whole lemon, right? So the idea for the shakers was that a lemon is a precious thing. You wouldn't want to waste any of it. So you slice up the entire lemon, peels, pits. Well, OK, they take out the pits. Um, but, but everything else. So this, this showed us. Um, showed me, I should say, a group of people who were on the cusp of a culinary change and were expressing their understanding of that, their social status, that they could have lemons, that they were familiar enough with them to use them in these pies. Um, some showed little variations like adding meringue on the top, um, different, sort of different kinds of crusts. So there's really, there's not a lot of talk about crusts in the 19th century, um, in case you're wondering. Um, and so it, it came to show me something that, um, it was, it was a, a moment of something really traditional, which is a pie, and then a step into modernity, a step into um, the, the, the newly accessible foodstuffs. And the reason that they're newly accessible is because of transportation, because um, new transportation options, new uh, ways to keep food fresh, new ways to grow things so that they can be picked and transported. So the beginning of what we think of now is the absolutely normal <laughs> industrial food system. You know, that is really fascinating that some of the lemon pie recipes are virtually identical. And it makes me think that some of them must have shown up in national press and oh, got, yes. got clipped because I think of my own cookbook collection, and I have a few historical cookbooks, and one is an 1877 Mrs. Henderson's mm. Dinner Parties. 
or dinner giving, whatever the exact title is. And when I got the book from Amazon, in reasonable shape, but their ha handwriting on the different fly leaves with recipes and a couple of late 19th century newspaper clipped mm -hmm. recipes that are in that book. And that's yeah. got to be how some of this uniformity gets yes, in. Yes, definitely. Yeah, so people, people read, um, read recipes in newspapers. They heard them from other folks. They, um, they received letters from their friends in other parts of the country. And you can, you can watch, like when I discovered Lobster Newburg appearing in books, I watched it spread from, um, you know, from the coastal areas into the heartland. And knowing, I mean, if you think about it, that the lobster that went into the Newburg in Rhode Island was fresh. And the lobster that went into the Newburg in Nebraska had to be something else. So yeah. there had to be some process that had been developed for getting something close to fresh lobster to Nebraska. Yeah. Um, and it, it also reminded me that there were, there was a different, a, a different range of flavors, um, things like pickled lobster that we don't use or think about anymore, um, canned oysters, which you can still see on supermarket shelves, but people don't, you know, consider part of their, their I, I don't know, maybe you all are out eating canned oysters. I shouldn't assume <laughs> so much about people. Um, no? OK. Yeah. Yeah. But, and oysters that were preserved in barrels, that were brought from the, the coast, um, that, that when we think of an oyster now, we think of only the fresh thing, right? Mm -hmm. Or possibly it's under the broiler for a second. But we don't think about all these other kinds of oysters that were part of the, the cuisine. And it's, it, it's that. Um, there's a, a level of diversity of flavors that also kind of gets written out of American food history. People tend to think of the 19th century as a, and especially the Midwest as a time of, of sort of dullness. Um, but I think the need to preserve stuff created a lot of different, more complex flavors than we, we, we remember collectively. Now you have argued that at least until the First World War, Regional American cookbooks were limited almost, limited almost exclusively to the cuisine of the antebellum South, creating this mythological, mythologized, <laughs> tough one, cookery of the Old South and valorizing the memory of the lost cause. Near and dear to my heart, my mother grew up in Georgia. <laughs> how did these books come about and why were they so popular and how did Yankees react? Well, this is the thing is that Yankees were the market for these cookbooks. So, you know, most of the publishers of the 19th century, um, most of the 20th century were in New York um, and Philadelphia and Boston. So the cookbooks that were published in this period were northern endeavors. They had sometimes southern writers, sometimes they had um, northern introducers. A lot of the books had a, would have a female author, but a male person writing the preface, introducing the story. Um, and they, these were among the least appetizing books that I read because they were so steeped in the notion of, um, of the food of pre-Civil War South as this ideal food because it had been produced by, by enslaved people. So there, this mythology of the lost cause is, um, is that the South had this noble cause to fight for and that, you know, too bad they lost, but they were noble about it. Um, to reinforce that, these cookbooks become part of that discourse. So the cookbooks say, um, once upon a time we had this beautiful civilization and it was so wonderful and the food was so great. And it's a, it's a really evocative way to get people to feel something for the past by giving them flavors. So the cookbooks tell stories of rich, uh, the, the, the groaning board of the, the table that's full of dishes so it's almost like about to break because it has so much food on it. Um, of, you know, of cream and whipped cream and butter and biscuits and hot breads, right? And all of this stuff was produced through unwilling labor. And what, how that's translated in these, these cookbooks is um, that what's, what can't be reproduced in the modern era is, that, is this food. And the reason it can't be, produced, re, be reproduced, and this is really what these authors say, is that the food was created through love. So the enslaved people loved the families who enslaved them. And that's what made the food so delicious. And the fact that the institution no longer exists means that that, that culture has gone away. You can't taste the past. 
and uh, you wish that you could. So the books are, are quite uh, repellent in their, in their politics, um, full of things that you think you want to eat, and then you begin to hear the story behind it. And, and, um, and I, I, I think of, um, there are a lot of recipes for something called a beaten biscuit. And the historian Doris Witt has written about this too. A lot of these longings for this thing called beaten biscuit. And when you read the recipes for beaten biscuit, it says, always says something like this, like, once upon a time before the war, you could get a really good beaten biscuit, but you can't get it now because nobody is willing to do the work. And it turns out that the work is beating biscuit batter with a heavy club for about an hour. And that's not something you will do if you have control of your own body, right? Um, so this longing for the food, I call this like the bread of suffering as the beaten biscuit. Um, it, it, but it really worked with northern audiences. They really bought into, and I think in many ways still do buy into the, the, the legend of southern hospitality without thinking about what came on, you know, what was underpinning it. Sorry to be depressing. That's my job, I'm a historian. Well, we can now flip that a little <laughs> bit and move to Fanny Farmer and the Boston Cooking School. Um, Fanny has been credited or accused, depending upon your perspective, with making cooking scientific and replicable, or de-skilling the cook by removing the elements of judgment and spontaneity with standardized level measurements, uh, and also popularizing the recipe formats that we know now of a list of ingredients and then instructions as to what to do with those ingredients. How do these different assessments of making cuisine scientific versus taking the heart and soul out of cooking reflect conflicting views of the meaning of cookery in the late Victorian period, which is when Fanny was writing? This is a really good question. Um, so I think the key to understanding Fanny Farmer is that it was a cooking school. And to, so to know who the cooking school was for, it can help you understand why she wrote the way that she did. And also, um, Farmer wasn't the inventor of level measurements, but she was the she um, was a purveyor of measuring implements. So before that, there were semi-standardized measurements and recipes. Um, you'll find things like a, a reference to a wine glass full of something or a coffee spoon. And for us, I have no coffee spoon, so I have very little idea of how much that would be. But I understand that my ancestors, had they been middle class Americans would have had coffee spoons and so they would have known what that meant. They would have had the right kind of wine glass to know what that measurement is. So standardized measurements as a concept sort of did exist before her, but then she sold cup measures and, and teaspoon measures. And so that we really, um, that we're uh, indebted to her for, I think. Um, maybe a lot of you are freestyling it without any, any kind of measurements in your house, but I doubt it. So. Um, a farmer's school and the school of Maria, Maria Parloa, who was one of her kind of rivals, those schools were set up for working class women to achieve a certain level of almost professionalism in cooking um, so that they could work in upper middle class homes. Um, being able to say that you were a graduate of the Boston Cooking School meant that you could charge more for your work. And knowing the rules as set out in Fanny Farmer's books, assured you that you could do what your employer wanted you to do. So again, this is a codification of a middle class cuisine. And it's the rules for the people who have to make it for money. So I, I think it, in some ways Fanny Farmer is misunderstood um, because, because contemporary uh, you know, people in, in our period see her as, um, as providing rules that restrict, when in fact in the time that she was writing, cooking was not thought of as personal expression. It was a job that working class women did for money. Um, it was occasionally something that middle class women did when the cook was out on her night off, if she had one night off. Um, and it might be something that they did for gatherings, for church suppers and things like that. So this is again why there are a lot of uh, desserts in these cookbooks is because that's what a middle class woman, woman would do to, to um, present to others like herself. Right? So at social gatherings, she wouldn't cook the roast herself. She wouldn't do the, the creamed onions. But she would make a charlotte or something like that as something beautiful to show off. 
So again, these, the recipes for desserts can be quite elaborate because they're show pieces as well. If you think about the Great British Baking Show, it's your showstopper at the end. Yeah. Um, is the thing that a lot, a lot of women were interested in making, which, which is why the, the cookbook seems so unbalanced towards sweetness. And then um, women, middle class women, then develop this reputation for being obsessed with sweets. Um, and it's not that they just lived on whipped cream. It was that that was their, um, their kind of moment of, of um, kind of performing their social role, putting together a pretty dessert. Well, that now brings us to a change in the early 20th century with the emergence of things like the corporate cookbook produced by entities such as Frigidaire and Campbell's. Uh, and they were designed to help the user navigate the new world of kitchen technology and convenience products many of which served a single rather than multiple functions, i.e. they take up too much room in your New York City kitchen. At the same time, diet cookbooks offered advice to women newly concerned with staying slim, mm -hmm. rather than that pleasingly plump body <laughs> ideal uh, that was uh, so prevalent in the late 19th century. So how do these cookbooks relate to women's changing roles? Right, so that, um, that was another thing that kind of surprised me. I was going, I was sort of traveling chronologically through catalogs of cookbooks and then finding these two um, things occurring simultaneously. So the appearance of corporate cookbooks, uh, which are, I should say not just cookbooks, corporate cookbooks I categorize as just all sorts of stuff. Um, the, these little booklets that would come with your refrigerator or that would come with a can of soup or um, all of the stuff that's presenting the object or the, the food stuff to the public and saying, use me, this is how you should use me, I'm usable. Um, that They appeared almost at the same moment as diet cookbooks and diet cookbooks that meant losing weight rather than gaining weight, which unfortunately totally went out of fashion um, until recently when we see like muscle building cookbooks. But there were, a, there was a beautiful moment in the, at the end of the 19th century when you could buy a cookbook that told you how to get fatter. I think we should try to return to that moment myself. Um, so what was going on, and I think Kathy is right that what was happening was changing ideas about women's roles. Um, the, the diet cookbooks um, really uh, strongly suggest to us that women are thinking of themselves now as beings in public people to be seen and to be judged necessarily, right? So if you're not, if you're hanging out in your house all, all day long like a 17th century housewife baking bread and making beer and slaughtering pigs and all that good stuff, you don't really care what people think of your body, right? As long as it's strong enough to do the work. But by the end of the 19th century, um, middle class women are appearing outside of their own homes and they're seen there. And then we begin to, they begin to think about what, um, not only do they begin to think about what they look like, but they, they uh, emerge as a market for ideas about women, what women should look like. Um, and so diet cookbooks are a way to tell them what to do with their bodies, right? What they should, how fat and how thin they should be. At the same time, uh, this rise in household technology, um, it, it's one of the ways that advertisers come up to push new products, things like refrigerators and, and ovens, especially self-regulating ovens and canned products is to tell women that this is going to free you up. You will be able to get out of the house. Um, you, it's amazing, you set your oven at 300, you put your food in, and then you can go out and live a life. You, you can be whoever you wanna be. Um, and this is a really new idea that, that womanhood is not, you know, womanhood is still tied to food, but it doesn't have to be tied to the household. So one of my favorite illustrations is of a woman turning a dial uh, in a kitchen on her stove and she's got her hat on. So you know she's out of there. Turns out you can't actually necessarily safely leave the stove on all day long when you're gone. Um, now we have Instant Pot for that. But it was, it was a, a, this really powerful suggestion to women that they didn't have to be at home. Um, and it was of course just a way to get them to buy stoves, but it had a kind of um, accidental feminism to it. Uh, one of the things I love most about the refrigerator uh, technology cookbooks, not technology, but the refrigerator cooking cookbooks, is that while they're creating this new ideal of cuisine, like that food should be cold and crisp, they're also talking a lot about the body of, of the woman who's responsible for the meal. And that also should be cold and crisp. So that to, to, um, 
to be a modern woman is to leave behind the sweat of your mothers and grandmothers. And it's not something that gets talked about a lot, the sweat that went into cooking. But when, you're, when you see the moment when the cookbook, the refrigerator sales book is telling you that you are going to be cool, it, it tells us that in the past, women were not. That they could expect to be drenched in sweat and very tired by the time that dinner was on the table if they worked in, you know, if they lived in a kind of middle class, lower middle class household. Um, that their mothers and their grandmothers had been hot, but they could expect to be a cool body. And you wouldn't expect ideals about, uh, you know, bodily temperature <laughs> to be part of cookbooks, but there they were. Yeah, that really is amazing when you think of what all of the advertisements in the 40s, 50s, and 60s of women dressed to the nines and high heels and, you know, father knows best, and, you know, June Cleaver, right. they're all in the high <coughs> heels walking in the kitchen. It is, it's a stunning assumption, and I guess some of them must have done it. That couldn't have just been completely for show. I, I don't know. It's just, certainly, it's, it's something that Growing up, I certainly thought, aren't you supposed to be dressed up to go uh, make dinner? Really? Well, it, it seemed from the popular image, uh -huh. you know, watching things right. like uh, June Cleaver, yes. which was... Um, and Julia Child freed people a lot from that idea. She wasn't really made up. I mean, she had her beads, yeah. but she was kind of... You know. And when you're six feet tall, you don't need to wear high heels. Right. You know, right. that's, yeah, that, had, that's good, she too. She that rela a relaxed persona in the kitchen. She yes, yes. She yeah. Right. She was a TV personality, right? Well, let's uh, take a little bit of a leap in time and talk about the Time Life series, The Foods of the World. Uh, they started yeah. in the late 1960s and they continued through the mid 70s during obviously a period of tremendous cultural upheaval in the United States. Now, they're conceived in the warm glow of this post-Julia Child mastering the art of French cooking, and the Time Life series was notable for the talent it assembled to write the various volumes. Um, and even separate chapters had people who were truly expert in their areas, well-known, uh, and they ha were lavishly illustrated. How, how many people have the Time Life series, Foods of the World, or a good number of them. You flip through them and the photographs are gorgeous even if they're a little bit of fa little faded over time. Um, so they're almost a voyeuristic uh, version of these foods and bringing cultures to the reader. Now they devoted I think it's seven volumes to American food, six of which are regional and they're nostalgic while the seventh is now called by the highly unfashionable term the melting pot. These volumes were incredibly popular among middle and upper middle class households, and they even now continue to be collected. How did the cultural milieu of the late 60s influence these books, and do you think it would be possible to undertake a similar project today? Hmm. Yeah, I think this is such a nice question, I, and I am embarrassed that I didn't really tackle it in my book, <laughs> but now, extra. Um, I, I was, I was excited to see them. I mean, I mean, I knew they were important because there was a big, you know, big bunch of them and they were capitalizing on something that had been going on in cookbook publishing, which was not just Julia Child, but in, an interest in um, all sorts of cuisines and, and um, um, a curiosity about American cuisines too. Um, so James Beard had, had written about American food as if it was actually edible, which was a new idea mm -hmm. for American cookbooks. Um, and he, his, his success had influenced it too. What I found was a lot more complexity and diversity than I was finding in other similar cookbooks. So other cookbooks about America at the time kind of repeated the same old tired stories of the pilgrims and the Indians and the, you know, and the, um, the, the enslaved people who just cook for the master and then kind of disappear as if they never existed after that. Um, and the Time Life books were actually much more interesting and subtle and, and a much better picture of the time that they were written. And I think that what that has to do with is that Time Life is a, it's a media company, right? So they had a journalistic perspective. And the people that they hired, they asked to write about the now. Um, so they're nostalgic, but they're, no, they're not nostalgic in the same kind of tired way. Mm -hmm. 
I remember in particular a man who writes about, of course I can't remember his name, but he writes about his New York state, like an upstate family and their, their farm, and it's not romantic at all. He talks about the chipping linoleum and how his family will eat a bowl of bread and milk for dinner, and that's what they call food. And he doesn't say, and it's pure and gorgeous and like gets you in touch with the elemental earth and all this stuff. It's not what he wants to eat. It's what they eat. And so he's, he's really reporting on their traditions. And I think that um, it's something worth looking at again in these books is the, um, the, the kind of journalistic eye that they had. They're not just fluff, which I kind of thought they were going to be because um, mm -hmm. Time Life doesn't have a reputation as being like really hard hitting as, a, as journalists. Um, but, but they were in some ways richer than other regional cookbooks. Um, a really wonderful example is uh, in a section about southern cooking, the person who is the cook, who's, who's represented as the cook of southern food, is Leontine Price. Mm -hmm. And she's interviewed in her apartment yeah. in Rome. Yeah. Um, and she's got a couple of Roman vegetables and she's got a couple, you know, kind of southern things that she's had people bring for her. And her cuisine is, is represented as truly southern because it comes from her. Um, and I, I thought that was really remarkable and, and surprisingly progressive for the time. Yeah. So other than Mastering the Art and perhaps those Time Life cookbooks, the specific books that seem to get the most attention in your food on the page are the Tassajara Bread Book and Tassajara Cooking, appearing in 1970 and 73. You quote from these counterculture works with their message of self-empowerment, and I'm slightly paraphrasing here, that you already know how to cook, and you note know that the foodstuffs are portrayed as the prime actors, the yeah. human cooks mere facilitators. I love that concept. Was the world as seen through the Tassajara books a golden age in American cooking? Mm. Oh, that's tough. No, did somebody say no? Yeah, <laughs> no. Um, no, it wasn't. Um, I think it, it's, it's a shift in how the, the kitchen experience is represented, but it doesn't get better necessarily. Um, so where before everything is about pre you know, presenting the food to other people, Julia Child is, um, although she's very laid back, you know that people cooked her competitively, right? I don't know if any of you had that experience of you cook a meal for a bunch of friends and it's a Julia Child recipe and your friends know that it's a Julia Child recipe and then you go to their house and they do it one better with three Julia Child recipes. And so it was very, it was very much about performance. The Tassajara bread book and um, cookbooks are, uh, there's a different emphasis which is on personal fulfillment. And it's not enough just to make the bread just as it would have been in Paris, which would be sort of the Julia Child style, it's you have to help the bread come into being. And that also feels like a pressure, right? Um, and you have to imbue it with your own spirit, but its own its spirit as well. So it's this very complex negotiation with a bit of flour and yeast. Um, and, and just a, a, a change in how um, the cook is represented in the cookbook, the, what is required of that person. Um, really changes in this period. And that brings us kind of into the era of the celebrity cookbook when you become, the cook is the, um, the, the cook is, uh, is performing their true self, right? And the celebrity cookbook has, um, you know, the celebrity chef has a, is this very unique persona that then you have to try to like recreate in your own kitchen. It's, they're, they're just a lot of, of, what am I doing here? Like waves. <laughs> Of, of changing representation of, um, of the, the cook herself, his self, in the cookbook, in the kitchen. And yeah, I'll, I'll ask you later why you would say no. Is it because the food isn't tasty to you? Or? Oh, I love my mm. red book. Should we wait? Okay. One of the things that I, my impression of it is that it, was, it came out of the counterculture. Mm -hmm. And I remember the recipe, the recipes, multiple recipes from muffins. Uh huh. Um, to you, so. you could make them whether you didn't have a, a leavening agent. I mean, there right, are right. a million different ways to make muffins depending on what you had available. Yeah. And they weren't going to be, certainly weren't going to be perfect. Um, so I didn't, you know, from what I recall, there wasn't that kind of spiritual element <laughs> to it. It was just like you could make these and even if you ran out of right. eggs and baking soda and baking powder and 
you know, you'll, you'll still have a muffin. It, it might not be the best muffin you've ever had, right. but. And that was something that also interested me about those books was that they do come right out of the counterculture. So they're out of a, a period of rejecting white middle-class cuisine, especially white bread, but they also hew very closely to those food ways. So it's um, the thing like, it's all this whole wheat bread and then there's coffee cake in it. So it, it, there's like not, it's not a complete break with the past. Um, it's an acknowledgement that people still want muffins. I mean, muffins are such a middle-class woman's food for her friends kind of dish. But take a look at the book again, because it has all this, this stuff in the beginning that often people don't look at because they're getting to the recipes. But for me, that's the interesting part, is the message in the introduction that says, what is this book for? And what is it, what is it telling me are ideas about American food at the, t at the moment? And, and, and his ideas, Edward S.B. Brown's ideas about food, um, were that it had nothing to do with corporate culture, right? That it was, it was kind of like this thing that just kind of grows in your kitchen. More gestures. I'm dancing my book. <laughs> it, so I'm getting the sense that in some ways it's a very empowering sort of cookbook that we will have the answers. We will be able to do this and we don't have to worry about right, right. exactly how it comes out. Which brings me to the question of food anxiety oh. in the kitchen. We all know that French food has been the index of culinary capital all across America in the 19th through certainly the mid 20th century with restaurants such as Delmonico's or Gourmet Magazine or even some of the uh, great French restaurants. But French food has recently seemed to lose its cultural capital and cachet. Most of the major French restaurants in New York that were institutions through the 1980s, Lutesque, La Côte Basque, to name a few, they've closed. Cooking schools such as the French Culinary Institute have been rebranded. Mm -hmm. French cookbooks also seem to be on the wane as compared with new releases in yeah. other, other genres. Nonetheless, Contemporary culinary gurus such as Michael Pollan laud the French for their attitude toward the table and what he perceives as a reverence for tradition and pleasure and recommends that Americans adopt a more French or more Mediterranean mentality to food. Do we have a schizophrenic love-hate relationship with French cuisine? And how does this conflict play out with our anxieties about what to eat nowadays? Hmm. Yes. <laughs> um, so I push back a little bit that through the 19th century, uh, French food wasn't held up above American food. American mainstream cooking included elements of French cooking, and there was no dichotomy. So there wasn't this kind of thing that was understood that French is good and American is bad. That, um, that discourse emerged in the 1920s, and it specifically emerged around prohibition. So the idea was that um, if Americans can give up wine, they're idiots, and their food proves it. Um, and that was a very new kind of idea. It also, it, it also um, came it into the sort of, the idea of French food as being better than American food, came into being as a reaction against nutrition, the ideas of, of uh, calories and vitamins and this sort of stuff, um, and also processed food, so these kind of three strands. But it's not till that moment that that dichotomy started, and I, um, I was really interested to find that uh, because I'd certainly been raised with the idea that, that French food is always superior to American food. Um, I think what happened is that we moved away from cuisines and into characters. So again, that's the rise of the celebrity chef, which happens around the end of the 1960s with Alice Waters and her crew, that they, they self-actualize and that be, through cooking. And that becomes the more attractive path. So it's, um, you know, there's a kind of an interest in Italian food that comes up. When was that sort of 1980s when everybody wanted to go to Tuscany and eat? Um, but but there, that was part of the move away from the obsession with the French, um, but also just a shift away from, from hanging on to one cuisine. So the, the big new chefs of Alice Waters' generation, they would just grab what they wanted and say, I'm taking a little of New Mexico, I'm taking a little of Italy, I'm going to Thailand and I'm gonna take some peppers, I'm putting it all together and that's me. 
um, and I don't care about the rules of cuisine. So again, it comes out of the counterculture, really. I mean, Alice Waters considers herself a countercultural person, that they're busting all of the rules to make themselves. Um, so, but yes, yes, we have, in American food discourse, we sort of like have every possible um, hero and villain going on at the same time. And there, there are a lot of heroes and villains in cookbooks. Every cookbook has the, the villain and the hero. And you, I mean, if you've read Alice Waters' books, you know about the heroic raw peach, <laughs> fresh off the tree, and, you know, and the villainous boxed cereal, and all that sort of stuff. Shall we open it up to some questions? Yes, please. Ask me questions. Um, I'm Stacy Lehman. I teach a course here called Food Narratives. Yay. So this is very, of great interest to me. Um, what I'm curious about is while all this cookbook stuff is going on, there are also these growing ethnic enclaves that are cooking wonderful ethnic foods, and they're not reading cookbooks. Is that right? I, I, I don't know if it is, but I'm... Yeah, the cookbook, so the cookbook publishing industry, like the entire publishing industry is interested in people who can buy books. Um, so they tend to focus on the middle class. Um, and, and I would say that, that the kind of cultural knowledge and embodied knowledge of cooking is everywhere. Um, there aren't people who, you know, there's not a culture that doesn't know how to cook and doesn't consider its own food tasty. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, it's really um, something that, oh, sorry. The, those enclaves are not considered really interesting by publishers until pretty recently. And, and now we're starting to, to see like cookbooks about Italian immigrant families. Um, especially with Italian food, there's a real problem that people think of Italian food as one thing and Italian American food is this corruption of the idea I mean, I was talking to an Italian-American chef who was saying that too, and she's from Buffalo, so she's like, she should, but she has no pride of place of her food. Um, so that, within that community, there's a sort of tension about what's, what's the good stuff? Do you have to go back to the old country to get the good stuff? Or can you have, um, can you just forget about authenticity, finally, and eat what you like, you know? Um, but I, I don't think I'm answering your question. Yes, people always eat tasty food for them, if they can afford it. <laughs> I'd like to make three points, because okay. um, my mind <laughs> was just, um, I'd like you, after I get the two other points, to, sure, I'm sorry, the role of magazines, women's oh, yes. magazines. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And when I was growing up, uh, my mother was a great cook, but she tended to, make the same thing, Monday, Tuesday, mm -hmm. Wednesday. And then Women's Day came out with the inserts. I don't know if you remember them. And every month, mm -hmm. there was another country. And she, and this was mm -hmm. not middle class. Right. This was lower middle class. Uh. And she would try things from China. Yeah. We had chicken, cellophane chicken. Mm. You know, and this is 1955. 56, yes. the Dutch portion. So I think you know we shouldn't forget about the women's magazines. Yeah. The, the second uh, point I wanted to make is I was actually involved with Time Life. I did some food styling. And um, how I saw those, and they were beautiful, absolutely mm -hmm. exquisite. I mean, the best food stylists and food photographers in the business right. were hired. It, they were aspirational. They yeah. really were not yeah. cookbooks to be used in the kitchen because you didn't want to stain them. Well, that's why they had the recipe book separate. Yeah. So they have the, the cookbook that tells the beautiful stories, and then it has these little spiral bound, which is most useful, mm -hmm. cook, little cookbooks with the recipes. It was brilliant. Well, let's talk about, after I make the mm -hmm. point, the aspirational oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. cookbook, including the whole series of Julia Child. Mm -hmm. Probably it's a minority of those people, like myself and other people in this room, that did every single Definitely recipe. a minority, yes. Um, <laughs> and then the third point I want to make, there was a wonderful article of uh, this Sunday Review um, on the role of convenience and how it was destroying, really, our passion. That, that is, that, uh, did you read the article? No. It was, take a look at it. Okay. It, it was a really wonderful 
article that with the convenience things, microwaves and so forth, that very often the passion of what makes us create and do things evaporates. Yeah, so that's, I guess I'll go sort of backwards. That, the argument about convenience has been going on for a really long time and people have still continued to enjoy cooking and to like what they're eating. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure it, it's possible to enjoy, to, to destroy people's passion for food. Um, I'm also interested in when convenience um, emerges, what, why it emerges and what its effects are. And it has a lot to do with opportunities for women, essentially. So, uh, you know, we struggle in food studies with this problem that the food that is really most, you know, maybe inspires the most excitement in us can be the stuff that it, it only exists because of a culture in which women were kept inside the house. So if you think about um, some of the most wonderful things in, um, in our culinary heritage as Americans or in the Middle East or in France or even in England, the thing can't be made unless somebody is spending all day making it. And to do that, you can't be elsewhere and do other things. And we all, I hope, we all want women out of the house doing whatever they want to do, but then you lose that cuisine. So a lot of the, the, the most sort of beloved cuisines are again, they're based on a kind of bondage. And in this case, it's, it's women stuck in houses with kitchens. Um, so it's a, it's a really complicated story, I think much more than just like, if you buy a can of soup, you've lost the joy of cooking or living, essentially. Um, so it is something that intrigues me and I keep, keep sort of wrestling with. Um, the Time Life books are, they are, yeah, they are travel literature, definitely. And aspirational um, applies to most cookbooks today, I think. It's uh, less the story, well, it's still the story in the 19th century that the idea that you could put on all of that stuff in those gigantic volumes that you, could, you would have the resources to do everything is something to aspire to. Um, I definitely think of cookbooks as a kind of fantasy fiction more and more these days too. Um, the beautiful images that you just get lost in and I think, in case anyone was going to ask me where I think cookbook going, publishing is going today, which sometimes people do, um, I think it's very, it's very much um, alive and well and has a, a good future because people use cookbooks for something other than cooking. And they're safe because they, you know, maybe cooking videos fill this void, but they don't, there's still the act of browsing and kind of falling into pictures that I don't know that can be replicated on the web yet, anyway. Sorry, I took your question. Oh, well, thank you. That is, this is all such interesting material, and I have so many questions I want to ask. I will try to get it all into one. Um, I am sort of taking away that the cookbooks sort of fall into, f I'm thinking four categories, the, the aspirational ones and the descriptive ones where the women contributing the recipes are saying, this is what we make, we make the lemon pie. <coughs> And then the descriptive ones where maybe somebody is saying, I traveled to Iowa and I <laughs> saw the women making the lemon pie. And then the fourth category is maybe the prescriptive ones, maybe the Alice Waters saying, this is what you should be doing, this is what you would be doing if you were doing the right thing. Right. And of those strands, um, can we, when, when we look at cookbooks and we're trying to figure out what was going on in the past, um, guess, how many of these recipes actually got made and how many got talked about? Oh, Fanny Farmer. Yeah. Um, That's so sort hard of to jump know. Jump into, yeah. Yeah, I mean, if something is repeated mm -hmm. for a couple generations of a cookbook, I would guess people were cooking it and eating it. Um, and this is when we get into the, the physical book, the material culture of cookbooks. Um, and my problem as a researcher, which was that libraries don't want cookbooks that have glop on them mm -hmm. for the most part. So I what you could find in the library is the cleanest copy. The cleanest copy is also the most silent copy because it doesn't tell you what, you know, what somebody loved. Um, I have an idea for a project. The Folger Library in Washington, D.C. collects what they call dirty books, which are books that are annotated and, and, and dirty because they've been lived on, essentially. Um, so to, to go through their culinary collection, which is kind of out of my time period and out of my global area, but. Um, just to see what you can learn if every book you look at is, um, is annotated with 
with evidence, right? With the, with the sauce and the crumbs and all of that stuff. But it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question for dealing with cookbooks. And I honestly, I don't think cookbooks tell you what people ate. I think they told you what the discourse was, right? Um, and I, I happen to be interested in words as much as food. So for me, it's OK. <laughs> Hi there. Hello. Um, so you mentioned that you don't think there is an imminent threat to the future of, of cookbooks. Um, you know, I'm interested in hearing what your thoughts are on, on social media and specifically mm -hmm. Instagram and yeah. as that being sort of a hub for where people get recipe inspiration, where they browse different recipes and maybe link out to blogs and also um, increasingly meal kits as well yeah. um, as a way to sort of, you know, a nod again to this, to this notion of convenience. Yeah, I don't know enough about meal kits um, yet to, to kind of put them into a category. I was thinking I should get one just so I can experience it and then have a better idea of what's going on. Um, but it does, it does the rem remove the, the need to read it first, right? But I think there's still a kind of fantasy idea like, I'm, you know, it's like an choose your own adventure kind of thing, right? I'm going to have this thing and I don't know how it's made and I'm gonna have the experience of making it. Um, Instagram is, you know, it's of course fascinating because it's so much focused on the visual pleasure of food. Um, in a way that was really, that emerged pre-Instagram. Um, so, you know, so the cookbooks beginning in the 1980s really um, put pictures in, 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 like made the picture the story often. Uh, and that has to do with a change in the technology of digital printing, um, which surprisingly was invented by Graham Nash of Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young. That's just a strange thing that I discovered on this journey, um, that he could, that you could now print, um, di photo, you know, images that retained their, um, the color saturation. So you can make much bigger, more beautiful images, and that really changes what you want to take pictures of. So this is when you start to see, like, the beautiful radish in the middle of the picture, and it's just the radish. I don't know what I'm going to do with it later, but there, you know, it's to inspire me. Um, and Instagram, it really, it, it helps to shape people's expectations of what they're going to eat, right? Is it Instagrammable or is it not? It's a whole new conversation with food, which is fascinating. Um, I'm crazy about the the blog, like food blogs. I mean, okay, so they drive me crazy because of all the narrative before the recipe, but and I, I don't know, you know, that's just something I have to live with because that's the form apparently. But the idea that you can annotate as you go is wonderful to me so that like every cookbook that ever existed before the web that was it right maybe you go into a second edition you tweak a recipe a little bit but if something doesn't work you don't know you bought the book you try it was it me was it the recipe in blogs the 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 writer will tell you oh i was wrong about that oh i found a new recipe for this you know um my favorite is, is Deb Perelman of Smitten Kitchen because she will constantly question herself and say like, Deb was wrong. This is what you should do. And that implies that maybe next year she's gonna find something different to do. And also the comment section. Yes, the comment sections are fantastic. So that's this dialogue with the author and with each other that can't exist in cookbooks at all. And it's really, I think, kind of democratizing and exciting and hilarious a lot of the time too. Um, and also proves the thing that I always suspected, which is that nobody follows the recipe, right? It just, why would you? You know, you're a thinking human being. Um, why wouldn't you just put a little something else in it? I mean, I'm sure some of you follow the recipe. For now. Uh, I'll make an observation then and ask you to comment. I, I think there are two interesting trends that proceed in parallel. Uh, in, in the past uh, 30 years, since the 80s or so, there's been a, a tremendous explosion of interest in food and ingredients and in cuisine, uh, both in restaurants and at home, uh, farmers markets, mm -hmm. so huge interest. And in parallel with that, there's, there's also a, a huge explosive growth in the sale of cookbooks. Uh -huh. So people are buying cookbooks. Yeah. At the same time, we're eating fewer and fewer meals at home and spending more and more of our food dollar in restaurants. And, and, and there's a lot of reasons for both of those, but, yeah. but how can it be that, that 
cookbooks are more popular than ever, mm -hmm. and yet people are doing less cooking and, and more d dining out. Yeah, because cookbooks are a kind of literature, right? They're, they're stories that we read that we don't have to act on any more than like when you read, you know, Anna Karenina, you have to jump in front of a train. It's this like, they, they don't, they serve a purpose quite different from what they're expected to, you know, you can get a recipe out of something, um, but you can also just look at the book. And all the time when I was writing this book, people kept telling me, oh, with this kind of guilty feeling like, oh, I have 900 cookbooks and I never use any of them. And I'd say, you, I am sure you're using them. You are, you're looking at the titles, you're looking through the pages, like, do you read them in bed? And people are like, oh yes, I read them in bed. And that's, it's just, it's a literature that's presented as, as being prescriptive, but, but is all kinds of other things too. Um, so I think that like, a lot of the reading of cookbooks is a way to, Sort of like situate yourself in your food world, and maybe you'll go to the restaurant, and then you'll buy the cookbook, and maybe you get it signed by the chef, and then you return to the experience through the cookbook, but not necessarily through cooking, because you can't cook like a chef. I, I can't cook. Another, uh, just a follow-up comment. Uh, another parallel trend is, is in the uh, 1980s and 90s, and, and even today, the, the changing design and architecture of houses. Mm -hmm. Houses are getting bigger. Kitchens are Not getting mine. bigger. Well, <laughs> kitchens are getting bigger and more elaborate and more expensive. So, so a lot of a lot of us desire this this you know TV ready kitchen, mm -hmm. but we're cooking less. Yeah, and yeah. again, it's it's status. It's it's the object that you have that says who you are, um, even if it's not who you are. It's um, also a lot of the gadgetry and design is part of the the bringing of men into the kitchen. Mm -hmm. um, so the idea of like that masculinity and cooking are not incompatible. Um, I mean, most of this is a, is, it's a marketing idea. It's a nice idea, but it's, it's an idea that's um, supported by uh, the, the opportunities to sell stuff. And the idea that you could entice men to cook if you gave them cool gadgets, which is you know, a stereotype of how men think about food. But it, it resulted in a lot more gadgets, um, which all sorts of people can use. But then a more, a more gadget-heavy environment, right? Um, which needs more room. Um, and yeah, the, if you look at design of houses over time, kitchens come and go. They open up, they close, um, they get other you know, features, they're connected to dining rooms, they're connected to little banquettes, and um, you know, the open kitchen, the eat-in kitchen, all of those kinds of things. Yeah, and I just wanted to add, I think on the cookbooks and why people are still buying them and reading them is it's, it's such an accessible format. Yeah. There's something wonderful. A recipe is on one, maybe two pages. Then there's the really almost lascivious pornographic, you know, photography that you see. I mean, I think a friend of mine who used to work um, at uh, Eric Ripard's Le Bernardin, gave me a copy of the cookbook that she had helped write for him. And flipping through, there were all these photographs of the different homes they had gone to to do this wonderful uh, book called A Return to Cooking. Mm -hmm. And there were chefs bare feet, just, you mm -hmm. know, from sort of mid-shank down, sitting outside someplace. And you're looking at this, and it's mm -hmm. like, this is a cookbook looking at his bare feet? Yeah. I mean, what's going on here? Right. So it is that sort of sensual pleasure and ease. It's digestible. Mm -hmm. If you're reading it in bed, as we all do, you can fall asleep after reading three recipes and you don't have to worry about, oh, where did I leave off in Anna Karenina? Right, right, right. <laughs> and your kitchen isn't messy. And your kitchen's not yeah. messy, too. I don't know why I made that analogy. It's painful. <laughs> oh, there's someone behind you. Your initial um, quote and response to the quote about um, eating being a, f a reflection of who you are, that immediately got me thinking about social media and also this new idea that um, people are not actually eating what they're photographing, they're seeking out. And that also brought up ideas of, you know, you touched on that with a diet cookbook and restraint and thinking of um, in Mad Men, she would prepare a whole meal for her family and then I think eat probably celery sticks on the side. I'm wondering, is there anything more to it than this idea of restraint in food beyond the diet cookbooks? Hmm. I'm not 
sure. Yeah, I'm not sure I, I know. I mean, because the, the text that I'm looking at really, except for the diet cook, well, even the diet cookbooks are telling you about something to eat. They're never just like, don't eat. Right, so that's a short book. Um, yeah, a lot of cookbooks will tell you what not to eat. In fact, one of my favorite cookbook writers is Helen Evans Brown, who was big in the 50s, or you know, busy in the 50s, I should say. She never became famous, but she has a cookbook where she says, tamale pie. I am not gonna tell you how to make a tamale pie because they're not nice. <laughs> and it, like, it was such an unusual thing to find, and she actually does it more than once in, in cookbooks. Such a strange thing to find in a cookbook because usually the assumption is that everything I'm telling you about is something to eat, right? Um, I think the idea of restraint is 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 a, is part of our cultural relationship to food, or it's part of our gender rules about food, right? Women are not supposed to pig out, um, but we, you know. I, it doesn't. It doesn't appear in cookbooks as much. I mean, there's. There are. If you look at diet cookbooks, there are a lot of, a lot of hints about how to suppress your appetite. Um, so maybe, yeah. Maybe I'm just not thinking about it hard enough. Um, what foods will make you feel satisfied? Those are fairly pathetic, sections. Um, uh, to, you know. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll find it mostly in diet cookbooks, though. It, when you're told what not to eat in non-diet cookbooks, it's more of a polemical, right? It's, the, it's often the don't eat, don't eat something processed or don't eat something American. The, I consider those diet, yeah, so, yeah, so something that has to do with the bodily health rather than just with taste and pleasure. That, I mean, of course, there's, it's all complicated, right? There's pleasure involved in restraint also. Um, so those cookbooks like, you know, the paleo cookbooks and the gluten-free cookbooks, are telling you you will enjoy food, and there's this sort of uh, this imperative that you must enjoy food, but you also have to be very careful about what you eat because of the effects it will have on your body, and your body is a public object, and all of this sort of stuff. But yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> well, I, I have an observation, and I wonder if you would comment on it that the time life cookbooks sort of represented the, the pinnacle of a literary cookbook. Oh, no. They, no. they were situated in the culture at large. Yeah. So for example, the Austro-Hungary Austro cookbook tells you that the proper Wiener schnitzel will have the color of a, a Bosch painting or a Stradivarius <laughs> right, violin. Right, 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 yeah. So I don't think anybody could get away with that now. But what, oh, what do you? I bet they could. Yeah, and I didn't answer your question about whether you could have the Time Life cookbook today. Yeah, I think you could layer on cultural capital in that, in that same way. Um, and other cookbooks did it. There was this book called, uh, it's I think it's Linda Wolf, The Literary Gourmet, that pairs sections of, of um, writing with recipes. There's the, what is it, the Modern Art Cookbook that has all the artists with their recipes. Um, but I think, I think you could definitely do that today. Um, I'm not sure what the cues would be. Um, but I think they're all they're all over. Um, chefs talking about the music that they listen to while they create food. Um, yeah, I think it's still an option if you want to try it. <laughs> the literary cookbook of today. Yeah. Yeah, but they're very. They do those time life cookbooks are very cult. They're very like the um, book of the month club, right? They're they're intellectually aspirational as well, yeah. Megan, and, yeah. Um, are, I mean, it, it, it seems like nowadays you would have a mixture of high and low cultural references, that it wouldn't be just yeah. high culture that they would be. You have to be cool and in, so you have to right. know the low culture references as well, right? So it would yeah. be an interesting mix of it what the like cultural Martha capital Stewart is. It would be like Snoop Dogg, right? Yeah, exactly. That's and you would I have would to know like. both, right? I mean, I don't know if she's not so high culture. But. Sorry, Martha. Yeah, or, or just think about something like Lucky Peach and oh, how yeah. that, you know, that was such a wonderful mixing of, you know, David Chang, you know, being completely vulgar and obnoxious. And then you had some really wonderful writers who were writing very elegantly and, 
you know, avoiding the uh, expletive stream. David Chang is sort of the snowboarder of chefs rather than a skier, right? I I'm sorry, I'm into the Olympics, so I'm beginning to think. Any other question? What does network is he? Oh, we do have one. Uh, now, I'm not sure how far back this is going to go, so if it, no, you can't, because they need to hear you. Oh, I think it can. Um, hi, I am super interested in all of the comparisons that you drew to where women's roles were in correlation to the narratives that you were seeing in all these cookbooks. Uh, based on everything that's happening now with a lot of women, uh, specifically food entrepreneurs, being women right now and not coming from formal training in culinary school right. and kind of encouraging people to go back into their home and make those really long roasts and uh, entertain in the home, how does that play into that overall arc of the narrative? Um. I think that has to have something to do with changing labor markets that I don't know probably enough about to talk about. Um, but the, you know, when I think about the people I know who are writing blogs that have really long, complicated recipes on them, they're freelancers, right? So it's possible to be both in the house and out of the house, right? Um, and, or they are, you know, they have blogs or they have cookbooks or something like this that, um, that I don't think they're just returning to the home, I mean, we know they're not because they're publishing, right? They're letting us know what they're doing. They're telling us that we can do this stuff too. Um, and it, it, it's, you know, it's this, this issue in women's history that we sort of come forward and then we say, but we don't want to lose this stuff, right? We don't want to not be the people who make the bread because making bread is really fun, but we don't want to be the only people who make the bread. So it's this sort of constant tension um, and it, it tells you that, that a lot of young women still feel connected to food and as part of their identity. You know, most of the food blogs are, are female in their representation at least, right? Yeah, what do you think? I uh, have most recently become super interested in people like Julia Sherman, who you mentioned, who wrote Salad for President, where she interviews mm -hmm. artists and really find out about their beautiful recipes. And Alison Roman, who did the like work for David Chang, did the freelance thing, did the writing thing, and now she's making really a beautiful cookbook that uh, encourages home entertainment and really bringing people mm -hmm. together around simple, accessible recipes. And I do believe that they have a little bit of flexibility in their lives, mm -hmm. and they've chosen to take the a not like 7 to 10 p.m. path mm -hmm. that a lot of us have in our work day. Um, but I guess I'm curious if you think that women can still be empowered and find themselves in those roles. I don't, I don't know. Yeah, I'm, I'm, it's hard because the, the connections to food and, and limitations are so strong. Um, it's hard to, to untangle them, um, you know. I don't know. I don't know what that takes, really, because it, it's so easy for people to see women in the kitchen, and it's so easy for people to see women fulfilling themselves through food, and it seems like enough, right? She made the most beautiful cupcakes, so that's it, right? Um, which it is for you know, I. It's hard to to say what's going on in other people's heads when they make the beautiful cupcakes, right? Um. We're talking about women in the kitchen, and what I see, and I even see it around here, are young men in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And what I've noticed uh, going to um, the farmer's market every Saturday mm -hmm. is the guys stepping up to the farmers and saying, can I mix these potatoes with my duck fat uh -huh. uh, at oh, home? Yes, can yes. I make this with... It's not the women. It's the guys. Mm -hmm. And I really do mm -hmm. think, and uh, that is a trend, you also see that, uh, at Trader Joe's, which one day I'm going to write a cookbook mm -hmm. using some of the more interesting mm -hmm. ingredients in Trader Joe's. They would but, appreciate that, I'm sure. <laughs> but the, the young men, yeah, all definitely, you have to do is stand right. around the frozen, and they're talking about how they use this and that, you know. Yeah, it's definitely there. It's become more comfortable for people classified as male to be in the kitchen and cooking and interested in food, and that's definitely part of new food media. You know, most of the celebrity chefs are male, so it, it, that also makes it attractive, right? You can be famous and fabulous and cook and be male. Um, I don't know, I don't know what the exact numbers are, but 
for the most part, most, what is it, 75% of cooking is still done by women who do it all the time. Um, and occasional meals are made by men. Not a lot has shifted in that. Um, and it tends to be, you know, the special performance meal is the, the, the male meal and the everyday quotidian meal is the female meal. Um, and the sort of care work food is female and the, um, you know, impress everybody cooking is male. And that hasn't, you know, that's professionalized and hasn't changed a whole lot lately. Who knows? Um, sort of in response to the last two comments, um, ever since you mentioned those beaten biscuits at the very beginning of your talk, I have been feeling a compulsion to go home and try that just to see if it actually works. Yeah. Has anybody? And so, like, I cherish and will not for one moment give up the 21st century conveniences we have, but just right. once I want to, you know, whack that biscuit dough for an hour. I mean, one I hour, I'll, I'll do it. it as long you know? as you feel like it. But, <laughs> but the point is that you can say yeah. when you're done. Mm -hmm. um, and there are machines, apparently, that make them. Uh, mm -hmm. And there are people who, who will still put, it, put, the, put their back into it. Uh, but they can stop, you know, and yeah. they don't. In, in those households, there had to be hot biscuits at every meal. And you know, so the South is famous for its hot breads. In yeah. the North, we have cold bread because you make your bread once a day and then you eat, eat it through the day. But if you have a captive labor force, you can have hot bread every single meal and you come to expect it, right? So that, again, that tradition is based in something, you know, unpalatable, to say the least. Is there a final question? Did you have a question? No? The final question. Okay, good. Well, I want to uh, thank uh, Kathy Kaufman thank and Megan Elias for a really interesting. <laughs>